What is the idea of India that means different things to different people? Is there a vision for the country's future that representatives of our political class, business and education world, the army and media share? To discuss all of this, we have an eminent panel this morning and I welcome them all on stage. It is an absolute privilege to have amidst us this morning Mr. Bhaijan Jayapanda, who is a member of the Lok Sabha from Kendrapara constituency, Odessa. He studied in the Michigan Technological University and with a background in engineering and management, he went on to work in the corporate sector before joining politics. Please welcome Mr. T.V. Mohandas Pai the chairman of Manipal Global Education and also a former member of the board and head finance and HR Infosys Limited. An honor to have Lieutenant General Ramesh Halagali, the deputy chief of the army staff, Indian Army. He hails from the Halagali village in Majol in Bagalkot district and was commissioned into Sikh Light Infantry in December 1972. He was Director General of Military Training till he was appointed as the Deputy Chief of the Army Staff on 11 February 2012. It, Lieutenant General Halagali was a whistleblower in 2009, 70 acres Sukhna Military Station, Landscam in West Bengal. Moderating this discussion is Mr. Veera Raghav TM. Mr. Veera Raghav was Senior Editor and Primetime Anchor with CNN and IBN. He has been a TV journalist since 1999 and has worked with NDTV from 2000 to 2005 and CNN and IBN from 2005 to 2013. He is a fan of Old Monk Ram, Enfield Ballet and the Beatles. We welcome you all, sir. Can you hear us? Yeah? I think it's a little hot for Old Monk Ram at the moment, but we'll have a you can't hear us? You can hear us now? So I think we'll have to be a little loud uh, to get across. Uh, we <laughs> don't have to be as loud as in Parliament. But uh, yeah, today we are here. Uh, of course, you've had the introductions. Three distinguished gentlemen speaking about their vision for India. Uh, we'll try and build a bridge between their three different visions and hopefully we'll have more audience as we go on captive on this discussion. Unfortunately, this is happening a day after that uh, one more maddening terror attack in Jammu. So we will discuss all the possible issues that probably confront this nation. Uh, we would have each speaker make his introductory remarks. That would set the tone for what is to follow. We will have questions as well from the audience. So after the speakers finish their remarks, if you have a question, just put up your hand. We'll get to you when we can. Uh, we'll start with Mohandas Pai uh, from the extreme left for his vision of India. I have a very, very simple vision of India. India as a country where every Indian has the bare necessities of life, a house to stay in, water in the tap, a sewage connection, 60% of Indians defecate in the open, food on the table, education for their children, a road to the house, and security of life, liberty, and property. A country where there is justice for everybody and the rule of law prevails. It implies that courts work, and in case of any criminal action or civil action, in a couple of years, the court will decide and not decide over 20 years. A country where everybody is free to practice their religion and live their life with full liberty, with all the rights guaranteed under the Constitution, so that there will be no turmoil. And we don't see this kind of hatred in our society. We don't see this kind of rights in our society. And we have a peaceful society. A society where women can walk in the late evenings, in the streets, with safety, and where our women are protected, and where we don't have such incidents where women are uh, possibly, uh, where bad people go after women in buses, in public areas, etc. And a country where parliament functions. We have a dysfunctional parliament where the opposition, the government, decided to shut down the country 
and they practice politics without caring for their citizens. And a country where every Indian can go after the great Indian dream to live a good life. I think this is the kind of country that I have uh, enhanced, I, I anticipate and this is my very, very simple vision of India because if you read our constitution, our constitution guarantees us right to equality, right to life, right to liberty, right to justice and if we are able to give all these rights to a citizen, I think we would have achieved the vision that the founding fathers gave us when they wrote the constitution. Thank you, Mohan. Uh, Jay Panda next, uh, if you want to... Thank you. You know, the, the old saying that to a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And therefore, I'm going to make a very limited uh, effort at explaining what my vision is, which is essentially political reforms. I come from a non-political background, but I've been involved with politics now for a dozen years. And that's because in a democracy, if we do not talk about reforming politics in a manner that it actually engages with people, actually addresses the concerns of the citizens, then you basically have a completely dysfunctional system. Many of the dysfunctionalities Mr. Pai was just pointing out uh, I want to say that my vision is actually not an original one. My vision is like deja vu, and I will explain that in a moment. That's a little odd to say at a literature festival, but let me explain what I mean. Democracy is often criticized in our country because we see all the failures. One of the examples being corruption, which is widespread. But a cursory glance around the world will show you that non-democratic countries are at least as bad and usually much worse. And if you don't believe it, just Google corruption with Egypt or Google corruption with China and you'll get a pretty clear idea. As Winston Churchill used to say, democracy is the worst of all systems except for all the other systems which are out there. And which is why I think we should be glad that we have a democracy, the world's largest. It is fated around the world. We are the ones who see the warts. The rest of the world sees the glory of our democracy. But we are the ones who need to fix the warts because we can't hope that somebody else is going to come and fix it for us. So the deja vu that I was talking about is that other democracies have gone through exactly the same problems that we are facing today. And there are particular analogies which are an almost exact replica of what we are going through today. And that's the deja vu I want to highlight before I conclude. The, the best example is the United States from the middle of the 19th century to uh, about 20 years into the 20th century. You know, in the middle of the 19th century, in the Senate, in the Congress of that country, they used to have fist fights, they used to have whips, wrestling matches inside their legislature. I mean, if that sounds familiar to you, in our country, that was the United States. What happened in the next 50 years is that country went from being primarily a, an ag agrarian country into a fast-growing, rapid economy where the majority of the people became middle class. We are experiencing, we are in the early stages of that. We have a rapid growth of the middle class. Our economy has been growing very rapidly for the last 20 years, leave aside the last two or three years. Uh, what happened in the U.S. in the latter part of the 19th century is described as the Gilded Age, where while all this was going on, you had huge corruption. You had those robber barons who cornered public resources, exactly the way we see in many parts of India today. And yet, what also happened, because they had democracy, was they had activists, they had citizens engage with the system, and gradually, over a period of three decades, known as the Progressive Era, that changed. And what changed is that their politics became much more open, much more transparent. And unless we can achieve that in our country, I'm afraid that all the other dreams that we can aspire to will be held hostage by the system itself. So just one couple of last words about the political transformation that needs to take place. Two or three examples, again, from that reformation in the U.S. 
about 100 years ago rings very true today. One example, their politics was not inclusive. Candidate selection was done in back rooms. If you had uh, nepotism worked, an old boys network worked, but in the progressive era that got changed, candidate selection became an open public process. That is beginning to happen in India today. With technology, with the rapid growth of internet and social media, it is beginning to become possible for non-political background candidates to engage with voters, to mobilize voters, and to level the playing field. And I'll tell you why this is important. The author Patrick French, three years ago in his book, India, a Portrait, pointed out that 75% of members of parliament below the age of 45 are hereditary MPs. Either their fathers or uncles or aunts used to uh, represent that seat and they have come in. And guess what? 100% of the MPs below the age of 30 are hereditary MPs. This is not politics. This is not democracy. This is a clique. And that clique needs to be opened up. And that is happening today. You can see with the public engagement and the rapid rise of the middle class, which means the middle class values of meritocracies this is gradually beginning to get traction. Uh, it's a still a long haul, and some of these battles are going on, and I urge all of you to engage with them. The battle to keep political parties under the Right to Information Act. The battle not to give special privileges to elected MPs who get convicted. The Constitution guarantees that every Indian is treated the same. If you're convicted, you either go to jail, if you're a bureaucrat, you lose your job, the same should apply to elected representatives, MPs, MLAs. And this is being resisted by the old guard. This battle is on right now. Some of these, the war is on right now, I'd say. Some of these battles are indeed being won. The consensus to overturn the RTI decision has been held back because some of us in parliament engaging with citizens like you were able to build up enough opposition that it simply could not pass. Brazenness, it seems, does have limits, but it only has limits if all of us work together to show them their limits. Thank you. Thank you, Jay Panda. And I can tell you, uh, if you've been following his articles, if you've been following his writings, he actually means what he says. Every word of it from the fact that breaking the clique in politics down to holding up a particular point of view when it comes to the RTI Act and maybe even holding up against a domestic political conspiracy. Next, uh, of course, Lieutenant General Halgali, uh, in times when security forces, national security seems to be one of those major concerns, a former commander of the Northern Command who served several years in Kashmir, retired as Deputy Chief of Army Staff only recently and is now engaged in uh, civil society work in Bagalkot District. Go ahead, General. My vision of uh, India gravitates towards national security. National security is not primarily focused on securing our frontiers against external aggressions and also defending the country from internal fissures. But more importantly, it stems from the fact that the armed forces are not merely the fist with the velvet glove. The whole anatomical body of this nation, the civil society, various appendages of this nation together make India strong. And in the committee of nations, unless India spearheads itself through a strong security framework and enables itself to cast its international shadow deep beyond its frontiers, we probably will remain mediocre. But what we see on the horizon today, that there are vistas of great wisdom. And these wisdoms are clearly indicating that our national security is becoming stronger, irrespective of what we are reading in the media in the recent past. Let me assure ladies and gentlemen here today that India today not only secures its frontiers, but has enabled the entire political framework to function and allow the geopolitical environment to enable itself for the fructification of socio-economic development. 
and if our adages at rising India, the aspiring society, but somewhere down the line we say there's a declining state. Now this is where I think we really need to focus on. And unless our instrumentalities that make nations' security strong, the armed forces alone cannot project power because there will be deep divides between that. But to attain that, I think primarily we got to have strong leaders and leadership is primarily the concern of, of national security. Leaders who are selfless, leaders who are honest, leaders who have a vision to take India forward and carry the tricolor of our country over the horizon. To achieve this, the leaders must be able to permeate an environment of values, ethics, aspirations, and above all, a strong character. I am now, having retired, I'm operating in, in, in remote areas. We're trying to work with our catalytic think tank in Bagalkot district. And believe you me, the young boys and girls, the people of this country want to see India rise. But somewhere fundamentally, the character comes into being. A, a flavor that gives them a different connotation of what is right and what is wrong. They, they, they tend to take methodologies to cut corners, to take shortcuts, to deprive excellence to take its shape where it can. And therefore, unless the character of the nation becomes strong, national security will take a beating. And my view is that while national security and internal growth and development are intrinsic to each other for development and for seeing India achieve its full blooming capacity as a vision, we must continue to focus on ensuring that the knowledge on which we are all gathered here today continues to grow in all disciplines. It's not merely engineering, medicine, the two favorite subjects, but all facets from one end of the spectrum to the other, which clearly defines how knowledge is going to shape the future of our country and in so doing, we'll ensure the security of our country and thereby give the citizens of our country great leverage for exploiting their entire potential for making India proud, for making India stand tall in the community of nations. Thank you. I think it's turning out very interesting because Mohanda Spai started off outlining what the ambition of civil society is and both Jai Panda and Lieutenant General Halgali, sort of putting a roadmap on issues that need to be focused. Mohan, you wanted to make a comment to General Halgali? I just wanted to speak about the economic aspect of this, of India, because uh, we need to understand that if you want to be a good country, you need to be economically strong. And I want to give you some data. We are a $2 trillion economy. We are not a pushover. We are the third largest economy in the world in purchasing power parity terms and the seventh largest economy in the world in nominal terms. If we continue to grow at 7% a year, and we can grow at 7% a year, despite all these political shenanigans in parliament, we will become a close to a $10 trillion economy in 20 years. In 20 years, we will go up in economic size by a factor of five times. Or the best opportunity for economic growth in a 5,000 year history lies in the next 20 years. And it lies for various reasons. The first important reason is we are going through what is called a demographic transition at a time when we are going to have possibly the youngest workforce in the world. About 650 million people in this country are below the age of 35. If you educate them and make sure there's enough work for them, we can create an economic output. Second, we are a country with a very high savings rate. Our savings rate is about 30% of GDP. And in the four years ago, we used to invest 37% of GDP and grow at 9%. And this growth will throw up enormous opportunities to get rid of the scourge that we have faced for the last 100 years of poverty, of uh, people who are very poor because of colonial exploitation. So in the next 20 years, we could see rapid economic growth, a huge economic output, change in the living stands of people, the achievement of the great Indian dream for every single Indian, provided we get governance right in this country. And we will create many Indian multinationals in many areas, because India sits at the sweet spot of information technology, technology and engineering like no other country in the world. For example, if you look at this place, this is an extraordinary place, like Jay said, the first world in a third world country. Now, 
we are sitting at a, we were sitting at the intersection of many many scientific discoveries and abilities which will give us the innovative ability to develop this country and if you mess it up because of bad politics and bad governance this opportunity will not come back i think if we just take this vision forward 20 years we will be among the global powers but more than being among a global power the general spoke about we will be a country which would have given all these citizens the promises made to us by our founding fathers when they wrote the constitution in economic terms that's right hopefully we will reach there in 2020 but to reach there as we were outlining and i just want to make this into an engagement between jay panda who spoke about the need for civil society to be to be involved in the political process when you see a rape and the kind of protest that one sees outside india gate or any of these places in terms of mass mobilization do you see that kind of mass mobilization possible from civil society when it comes to deeper issues of let us say rti or issues which are not really one particular incident it is something that is more of a social malice do you find that kind of engagement coming forward i'll answer that in a minute but i'll put the context uh, just in a segue from what pai was saying uh, you mentioned governance at the end of your vision for economic development and i think that's the crux of it that's the point i was making that economic potential that we have will be severely handicapped if cases take 20 years in the courts if uh, the police are not responsive but we need to understand that these are not symptoms uh, i'm sorry these are not the uh, the root of the problems these are symptoms what is the root of the problem root of the problem is let's look at let's look at uh, the judicial system we have an abysmally low ratio of judges to population if you look at developed countries the least that any developed country has is 50 judges per million population some of the more developed countries have 100 judges per million population we have 1 3 13 i have been advocating that we need to at least quadruple the number of judges that we have it's both about quantity and quality some people say you know it's not just quantity actually it is you know the quantity is necessary but not sufficient you need to have qualitative improvements in the process as well you cannot have indefinite adjournments which happen in the judicial system today fortunately the fast track courts which we have set up are setting a good example they have they have uh, disposed of 84% of the cases given to them within the last few years but yet we do not have consensus to provide a budget for setting up large number of fast track courts for at least tripling if not quadrupling the number of judges that we have these are the kind of changes that we need to why implement. do you think it's not happened why do you think it's not happened considering that the problem has been stated it's been discussed and it's not just been discussed today it's been discussed now for the last 10 years why do you think it's not happened uh, we have we are the only country we are the only democracy in the world that got universal adult franchise on day one correct every other democracy took hundreds of years well we are one of the, the, certainly the biggest significant one every other democracy like the us and the uk took hundreds of years to achieve that and we have the problem of grappling with the urgent and not paying enough attention to the important you know when i enter into dialogue particularly with corporate india everybody seems to think that why can't we just have rational economic policies why do we have to have populist policies well the fact is in a country like india with more than 1.2 billion population with so much uh, still several hundred desperately several hundred million desperately poor people you will have to have some degree of populism wishing that it isn't so is not realistic so you need to have a balance between taking the important steps that will pay off in the next 5 10 20 years and also dealing with the populism that is inherent in any democracy okay, mohandas pai wants to Jay, i disagree with you because for every civilized society the first thing is justice you must give justice to people you can't give justice but, over 20 years mohandas, i'll tell you why it is why we don't have enough judges because the political leadership doesn't want to expand judges they want 20 years 30 years for court cases because they can get away with murder they can get away with rape they can get away with looting this country lallu has the fodder case for 20 years and the judgment but is on Mo monday Mo wait i'll finish my judgment is on monday and because it's a monday they're getting the ordinance passed by the president of india so he'll not be disqualified 
because if he's convicted, he has to leave parliament. Now, this is a rigged system by a political leaders who don't want justice for the people, who want delays, who don't want to invest in justice system, and we, the citizens, are not fighting back and demanding justice. Do you agree uh, with well, me, Jay? Well, you know, I think Lieutenant General Halgari wants to. No, it's amazing. I mean, India is a large democratic country. If the armed forces are an island of excellence in, in the delivery of justice, why is the country not looking at what the, the modalities, the procedures that we are following? Here, the systems are so rapid. I mean, a, a convict is nabbed, is immediately subjected to his trial, and within 90 days, the judgment is given and is put behind bars, and whatever is required to be done. If our military cantonments can be so clean, so well-regulated, and so nice, why are the municipal, the corporations not adopting those those, those fundamental rules. Here in our own country, we have such shining examples of the armed forces. But certainly there are reasons why they don't want to follow these uh, wonderful examples. And I'm what sure... The what are the now, there are reasons. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't like to dwell on, 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 on the political issue. Uh, yeah, please. Let me put that to Jai Panda. The political will is what people who are working with civil society often believe is the problem. But why is there no political will? I mean, it serves the interests of a politician as well to have a country up and running well. Or is there a point that we are missing? Why does it not serve the interest of a politician to have a country on a justice system up and running? What have I been saying from the beginning of this discussion? If we do not engage with and we do not reform politics, none of the other things that we are talking about is going to get reformed. And uh, what you just said, I agree with you. But ranting about politicians being the problem is not going to solve the problem. You actually have to come up with a solution to the problem. Uh, the solution to the problem is enough people have to be agitated about it and do something about it. The reality, the blunt reality is that people like us have not had the numbers, have not had the engagement with the system, to matter to politicians. Yes. That's the blunt truth. Yes. Now, one of the messages I take to people in the middle class, by the way, India is, a, is an odd democracy where when people achieve middle class status, they disengage with the system. Yes. Now, in other countries, you go to other democracies, it's the people who are middle class who vote in greater numbers yes. than the people who are disenfranchised. Yes. The inner city poor in any developed country vote less than the middle class. It's just the opposite for us. So please share some of the responsibility. One of the, one of the messages I take to people is that you don't have any right to complain if you don't at least vote. Uh, the vote may not make a difference today. You may not like the candidates on offer today. But I beg of you, please hold your nose and vote for the least bad candidate. That's the way you're going to bring about changes. And I'll, I'll just, just answer just, that very quickly. Before that point, uh, before you go into that point, I just want to take that across to Mohandas Pai as well and ask him one very simple question. Is there an arrogance of virtue when it comes to the mid Indian middle class as well in the sense that we will point to all problems, we will come out on the streets and claim that we've done our bit? Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm asking you this I, very seriously I, because when you speak about MNC growth, is that the only growth model that needs to be followed? Are we even willing to retrospect? The Indian middle class is cynical. It's cynical. It moans and groans, but does not do anything to engage the political leadership that distance themselves from politics. I'll give you an instance. Who got us freedom in this country? It's educated middle class, accomplished people, people who are educated very well, people had a view of India. They led this country. After independence, where are these people? The middle class doesn't want to engage in politics. Jay is the odd man out who is very accomplished coming into politics, sacrificing the life, his, his, his personal life, his family life, his personal economic interest to get into politics. Where are all these people? We want, Nandan is now coming, people are tweeting and saying, why should he be in politics? So it is the cynicism of the educated middle class which has stayed away from politics, disengaged, which has caused this theaters and bad is governance. It, is it cynicism or is it an an aversion to getting the hands dirty because I'm asking you this because a lot of middle class candidates want to contest as MLAs or MPs but don't want to go to a civic body elections. 
They no, don't I, want to be no, municipal no, let, councillors. Let, they don't want to get down to the slums. They don't want to be there for the people in the slum. Look, after independence, the educated middle class went into the economic era and gave up politics. The freedom movement was led by the great mass of people who rose up to answer Gandhi's call. Remember that. It's a mass movement. What happened to the mass movement after freedom? They went away and now we are suffering the consequence of that. And there's one more reason which is very, very important is we don't have a tall figure to stand up for India as a whole, who can be a leader like Gandhi was, or possibly Nehru was, who could come forth and tell people what is required. We don't have any inspirational leadership. And that again is creating a distance. Now, but now, we are seeing the middle class come into politics, engage with the politicians because they feel if they don't do that, they're not going to get the society that they want, and their tax money is not going to be used very well. The concept of the taxpayer that is in Western democracies is not there in India. We have this feudal concept that money is the government's prerogative and government can spend wherever they want, do what they want for any populistic action. So unless so, the middle class comes forward, I don't see good governance improving. I agree with Jay. So how do you get the middle class forward? Is there, Jay Panda, should, should there be a completely different approach to politics itself? Gandhi wrote about this in 1937 on, on how individual change is the most important when you want to build a nation. And, if you're not focusing on individual change and if your middle class is going to be only on aspirational values of building, building, more buildings, then is there, is there got to be a, a socio-economic political change in the mindset of India and the Indian middle class for them to come forward? Let me tell you a blunt truth. Nobody is going to come and improve your India for you. Yes. Yes. Okay? Yes. Now, over the, past, over the past three or four decades, from the late 60s, the leaders of that time figured out that there was much gold to be had, much political gold to be had in populism. Because at that time, maybe 80 or 90 percent of the population was not middle class. And uh, populist issues took hold of the political dialogue of the day and have held sway. The middle class disengaged and has stayed largely disengaged, except sporadically. You've had the middle class engaged during the emergency in the 70s. Lately, you've seen the middle class engage on the issue of corruption and on the issue of uh, violent crimes against women. And both are beginning to have an impact. The problem is, because we've had four decades of a downward spiral, you're still going to see more examples of the bad and fewer examples of the good. And if you get overwhelmed by that and you remain disengaged, you're going to get more of the same of what we have today. If you do see the green shoots of some reforms, of some changes that are happening. By the way, I want to give you a little bit of good news for those of you who haven't been on Twitter. This morning, the Supreme Court has ruled that the Election Commission must have a new button on the voting machine rejecting all candidates if the voter so wishes. I can tell you, more than 95% of my colleagues are dead set against this. They are horrified. I welcome it. I think a small minority of us in politics welcomes it. I'm confident that in the manner in which I've engaged with my constituents, it'll be very hard for somebody to go and tell them, tell a majority of them to reject me. So uh, because I have that confidence, uh, I can say that. Uh, the reality is that some of these progressive steps are being taken by courts. And you ask the question, why politicians are not changing? Because we are in the middle of a transition. Most of the politicians who have got to where they are have worked this system. They have figured out how to game this system to come to the top. They are, they are status quoists. They are not change agents. But there are a few of us, and I'm not the only one, uh, I want to point out, even though I'm in the opposition, uh, and I have been opposing this, this bill to, uh, to give uh, elected MPs the chance to continue even after being convicted, today uh, the minister Milindevra has come out, and yesterday yeah. spoken against it. That's courageous because he's part of the government. And I'll tell you why. Because he represents South Mumbai, where people like you and I are gradually becoming the majority. If he does not speak out on this issue, he is bound to get hit very badly in the next election. As more and more constituencies become like this, they don't all have to become South Mumbai, but as more and more constituencies become susceptible to middle class anger and what Tom Friedman calls the aspirational middle class, 
another 300 million people beyond those who are already middle class. These will matter if these people vote. But isn't there, isn't there a problem in the way you are outlining it in the sense, and I'm asking you this, that the middle class believes that it has to be the opinion leader and is not really taking the rest of India along with it in a sense that there is no engagement between the middle class and what we say are the lower classes of India. So even now, when we are discussing opinion leadership and the change coming through, why should it come from a one section of the society? Why should this society, which lives in urban centers, lead or show the way for an entire nation? That's actually a brilliant question, and let me answer that. Because in democracies, it is people who believe in meritocracy, it is people who believe in hard work, it is people who believe in thrift, who actually believe in democracy and set the agenda. Mondas just pointed out that our founding fathers and mothers were all middle class. They were lawyers, they were professionals, Gandhiji, Nehru, all the others, uh, Ambedkar. But how they were different is exactly what you said. They were not cocooned in the ivory towers that many of us are. They spent enormous time and effort and sweat engaging with the rest of India and carried them and developed a vision which is our constitution of India, which is something we can all be very, very proud of. So I do believe that the middle class will always have an edge in setting the agenda. The middle class is growing, so its clout will keep growing as long as they engage with the system. And so its responsibility is much greater. Its responsibility is greater, but not if it believes in, in, in isolated silos. All the other silos have to be carried along. And stop tweeting and start voting. Uh, I'd love to uh, draw parallels on, on issues of leadership. Why is the political leadership not demonstrating those skills, those qualities, those aspirations of leadership? I mean, you can keep on arguing that they are corrupt, they are incapable, they are inefficient, they are, they are, they are, they are bogged down, and oh, you could call it anything. But ultimately, the leader requires training. The leader requires motivation. The leader requires to function under a set piece of parameter. There must be ground rules of engagement for him. There must be systems in place which enable him and make him move on a channel and not allow him to drift. These are issues which the governance must put on plate for him. Unless the system, unless the nation creates a system for our leaders to remain on track, to ensure transparency and accountability of every action they take, and they're subjected to inquiry and investigation, you will find accusations of corruption, accusations of inefficiency going on them. And therefore, I have recommended in this entire process of catalytic that I'm working on, that the earlier the networks are spread out, earlier the finances, issues relating to ground, terrain, and, and land, issues relating to, to jurisprudence are put on parameters. And that requires a lot of scientific, technological innovation. Today, what is happening? You look at, we are in Bangalore, the silicon. I mean, we are sitting in, in the most world's largest silicon valley. The entire focus of our effort of IT is only in the banking sector, in, in, in commerce and trade, in insurance. You go into the 80% of our country, into the vast rural areas. Is there any automation? Is education, health on automation? Is our leaders there being motivated to become and rise to that middle rank? The answer is no. And if the entire percentage of economy relating to agriculture, industry, and services sector has to be turned completely today for India to rise and become a major power. I think we must focus on those areas where, where automation, uh, propriety, accountability, and transparency is more important. And therefore, leaders of today must remain on those tracks founded by a strong governance systems. And unless this system moves together, we will continue to dither and have poor leadership, poor results coming out from this nation. General, as you're engaging with youth in Bagalkot and in rural areas, is there a sense of anger in them about what the cities have and what they don't have? Or is there a sense of the only way we're going to progress is move to the city? Absolutely true. Believe you me, in the last two months that I've been moving across the countryside of North Karnataka, a region which is full of potential, a region that can transform the, the, the entire country, is devoid. Devoid of what? There are millions of graduates with certificates kept in their boxes or hung up on their walls, but they do not have the spirit of inquiry. They do not know what creativity is all about. 
they do not know what futuristic planning is all about they are not integrated with the future trends that are there so what are we talking about this large number of educational institutions that are coming by and therefore this whole process of transformation carrying the baton from the first runner to the last runner is so critical in a, in a, in a 400 by 100 meters race we must get the rural areas immediately and and and, and ensure that this rural area becomes strong of india because that is the future of india and unless that segment of our country rises the small middle income rising economy of india will not be a shining star that's my personal belief and jay panda you've been on on twitter pretty often you get most of your opinions and views today even if it's national television on twitter i just want to know how twitter or any of the technological innovations of today can bridge the gap between a rural youth sitting maybe in bagalkot and in the it capital of india allegedly bangalore uh yes i was on twitter even as we were talking and i have been getting some feedback from people in the audience who are tweeting you could you, could, you, you uh, could stop tweeting and raise your hands and ask a question instead yeah um i want to make two quick points here one point is that there is an ongoing debate whether social media is going to have an impact on politics uh i have stated that in this election it is going to make its presence felt but it won't be a game changer but in one or maximum two more elections social media particularly uh, tools like twitter facebook etc are going to be game changers and i'll go back to what i was saying about the columnist tom friedman who says india has 300 million middle class and another 300 million who are aspirational middle class they don't have all the uh, goodies or all the qualifications that a middle class person might have but they have some of them and they aspire to the same uh, kind of life now these are the people the this potential 600 million that are impacted and can be engaged through social media uh, we've seen the effect of social me media in organizing flash mobs for instance i think that is very applicable to politics now you've seen flash mobs to protest against the delhi rape case you've seen flash mobs to protest against corruption all organized through social media uh, i think as the the internet has more access and as more people in india have access to the internet as social media usage grows this will have a very big impact and this is this is blurring the lines between urban and rural now we all grew up in a generation where there was very little information you had one government television channel today you have nearly 800 television channels and the internet which is already past 150 million connections in the country all of them asking the nation a question not all of them asking the nation a question no. you know that the thing is information which is crucial to a democracy was actually quite limited for many many decades until now i want to conclude by saying something to an earlier question you asked what is it that you expect the middle class to do beyond organizing protests and all that i said look it's not your job to be politicians if you want to be that's fine and i think we should level the playing field but that should not be a necessity uh but i think everyone every indian and particularly anyone who is middle class or above needs to have one passion to improve india for the good i've been doing some brainstorming and i've been throwing out ideas at people i want to throw out an idea at you today uh this came from a brainstorming discussion with some activists as to how to get the middle class more engaged with the political system just to vote because such abysmally low numbers of you actually vote uh the idea that was given to me is that if we can bring about a change in the system that would allow you to vote online at home with some kind of biometric identification it would be a game changer now there is nothing in law that doesn't permit it it happens in other countries already i'm not saying this has to be your one idea you can pick any one of a dozen dozen ideas you don't have to be active on every single issue that impacts india but pick one and spend an hour a week on it lobbying engaging with people making phone calls sending out emails writing op eds it still won't lead to change overnight but in a period of a few years your idea could get traction i think tweet a vote would be a Venkat, would be a game changer uh, when it comes to the go ahead mohan venkat i want to raise two issues 
And one issue is of election funding, which I think is at the core of what is going wrong. If we, accept, if we expect good people to stand up for election, spend their own money, sacrifice their economic interest, the lives of their families, and do good work for us for the next five years, we are crazy. Those people don't exist, except maybe like a Jay Panda. None of us want to give money for elections. How many of you have contributed to the election campaign of a candidate? Not one has given money. Yet to stand up, moan and groan and you crib. You must give money for candidates for elections. And you must go give them whatever money, 100 rupees, 1000 rupees, 1 lakh, please give them money. Give money to political parties and demand that they come out and use their manifesto for social good. And, and before that, do that, know your candidate. And, and two, know your candidate before you Know your candidate. Them. And two, very importantly, which what you have to do, talk to the election commission about raising this absurd limit of some 18, 25 lakhs for an assembly and 45 lakhs for an MP. Every MP in parliament, I don't know about Jay, tells the big lie when he goes to parliament, he has spent less money than the legal limit. Everybody is lying. There could be a few people... But who outside lying. parliament, they agree that no. they spent two crores. No, no, but they they spent, of... and spent two crores. And in like, Bangalore, I met MPs who spent, they spent 15 crores. Nanda Nilakani may contest Bangalore South. You think he can only win by spending 45 lakhs? He has no black money. What is he going to do? So I think we must change this election law about funding, like the Obama campaign, allow people to contribute, remove all the limits, because without spending money, we, we cannot do. Second important thing I want to raise, which Jay is here, which is very important, parliament froze the seats in parliament and the state legislature based upon the population in 1971. And again, it had an amendment to parliament in 2004 or 8, where they froze the seats, but within a particular city, a particular state, or in the country, the urban population and the rural population, they were balanced. But they took the 2001 census. That means India is 34% urban today, but the 2001 census says India was some 28% urban. Only 28% seats to parliament and the state legislature go from urban India. And they froze the same law till 2030. By 2030, 2025, India will be 50% urban, but we will have only some 28% of seats in parliament. It means the educated middle class and urban people are disenfranchised for 20 years, and that is another of these political shenanigans played on us by our parliamentarians because they are disengaged us because we demand performance and we cannot be manipulated, both because of goodies, and this is another big issue that has to be changed in case we have to achieve a vision. That's right. I think uh, we've We've had fantastic points being made. If, if those who have been tweeting would like to stop tweeting and stand up and ask a question, we'd like to take it. Uh, because I know it doesn't, Twitter is free on all our mobile phones. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, and if there is a mic that can... Oh, you've got only two mics, sir. Uh, you could just come up and... Sorry, we only have two mics, two candidates. Said about voting, right? Uh, who, you, who are you asking the question to specifically, or, or is it to all three uh, of them? Uh, any one of you can okay. answer this question. So actually, I did vote in the last election, uh, so I found none of the candidates were clean, and you know, I did, we did a profiling of the candidates, went to the internet, checked out, you know, how the candidates are. But the problem is there's a lack of information as to what kind of work they have done. Uh, because most of the information is uh, what is compiled by the election commission. That information is not enough to make a call, actually. That's a, that's a very good point. Uh, but that is changing. Today, there are several NGOs and other organizations who are compiling. One of the best known is ADR, Association for Democratic Reforms. They list all kinds of data on candidates, including their, uh, you know, any criminal background, including the work they have done, what committees they have represented, their attendance in parliament even, so many other things. Uh, this is still a work in progress, but today the options are there. Uh, and uh, like, like I told you earlier, as of today, the Supreme Court has given you the option of rejecting all the candidates. Yes, yeah, so next time, possibly you could reject all candidates, unless it's Jai Panda and you're voting for him. <laughs> Sir, I can't hear you. Uh, Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> what is the point in saying that the, even the common people should be able to fund uh, the election? Today, what the politicians are doing, they are collecting money. For, it is the big business houses that are funding elections, that are funding the politicians. And they know 
that if the politicians get elected, they can get back what they have donated. Do you think that even common people can afford to donate money for the election? Who funded our independence movement? No, 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 I am not talking... I'll, I'll come to your point. Yes. Who funded the independence movement? The common man. Pardhan Nashi women came forward, gave their bangles. People gave whatever they had in the hand to fund the freedom movement. We must now all come forward and fund the political leaders. The enough honest people who will not take money from crooks, or smugglers, or drug peddlers, or crooked businessmen. The enough people will not take money. But they are forced to go there because you don't give money. Please give money. Please get together, fund the elections, and you will see a change in politics. They will not, there are enough good people not to take bad money. I just want to add a supplementary question to, in fact, all three of you. Is the problem also Jay Panda, Mohandas Pai and Lieutenant General Halgali that in the last 15 odd years, we've not had a socio-political movement come up in India? Because every socio-political movement, whether it was the Janatar Dal and from which the BJD comes up or the BSP, they had involved the society and they did not get corporate funding to start with. They had actually garnered money from the people as they grew. They started getting money from corporates after they came to power, but funding from corporates after they came to power, but not in the stage of growth that they were when they were building the movements. Is there a need for a socio-political movement amongst the middle class? I'm not wanting to take any specific names like the Aam Aadmi Party or any of those things, but is there a need to involve the middle class in a socio-political movement? And I just want quick responses from all three of you. General, you want to respond to that first? Is there a need to have... Uh, the general is throwing it away to civil society and politics. Of course, there's a need to have social political engagement. And you gave a good example of new parties formed which are engaging on the issue of corruption, engaging on the issue of uh, law and order, and, and things like that. Um, you know, I want to make a point here, which I made... I want to reiterate something I said earlier. The system has been in a downward spiral for about four decades and those who have succeeded in this system have ensured that it becomes difficult for good people to enter. You, you gave those examples. But unless good people somehow force their way in and those people are not status quoists and they change the system, we'll never see that. So that's the point I keep making. If you don't support even the few good people that you see in politics, you're not going to say more, more of them. Even the few that are left will, will wither away. And again, let me reiterate, please look at the green shoots of reform. And I don't mean economic reform. I mean political reform that is already happening. Let's take an example. Today we know that 76 MPs have criminal cases against them. How do we know this? Because a decade ago, there was one little reform that happened that forced MPs to declare criminal cases against them. Now, this was resisted by the political establishment for many years until it was finally pushed through. Now, similar efforts are underway. That all right, we've got the information. Now let's take action on it. Let's disqualify them when somebody gets convicted. This is being resisted today. It will not be resisted forever because more and more voices are speaking out against it. Look, let me end by saying, you want to look for the bad, you'll still find plenty of bad. You know, if, you, if we are here to just talk about the problems, we can be here till kingdom comes and we'll be talking about the problems. I also want to talk about solutions. I also want you to recognize where good things are happening and put your weight behind it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this. I, th I, th I think we need the middle class to be engaged. Bangalore has the politic Bangalore Political Action Committee. They endorsed candidates, they funded candidates. Nobody gave money except three or four people. That's a sad tragedy. But I think if more citizens in more cities and towns form political action committees to engage the political leadership, raise money for campaigns, and demand performance, we'll see a sea change happen. So we need socio-economic movements of many types, including political action committees. I think... Um, um, one of the very fundamental issues is, is, uh, is growth and development, a socio-economic development on this pattern, where you premise and judge a leader by his contribution towards growth and development. If that parameter, if that figurative assessment is clear, let him stay afloat, otherwise just drop him off the ship. I think that that's a clear indicator. 
of, of socio economic development where growth and promotion of development becomes the central theme of his, his survival, salvation of his life. And that index has to be quantified. And the moment we do that, we are on the right track. I, I think just because Mohandas was mentioning about uh, the Bangalore Political Action Committee, I remember during the last Karnataka elections, uh, some of the people I had met had said, yeah, you know, Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, Mohandas Pai, they've started it, they will fund it. Why should we go and give our money to it? We will go there. We are, we're there for the candidate they've chosen. Now, if that's the attitude, then, well, it's, it's pretty much like newspapers. If you don't pay for a newspaper and you're going to let it fund by advertisements, you're going to get a bad newspaper or a bad television channel at the end of the day. So funding politics. Last question for this session. Oh, the, my question is to Mr. Jay Panda. The thing is, we as a nation seem to be obsessed with personalities. See, the, uh, the example I'm quoting is, see, two years back we had this huge Anna Hazare movement in India, which stood for, uh, which was an austere movement, which stood for thrift and uh, the middle class values. And now we have this pro Modi movement, which <laughs> stands for flamboyance and, uh, you know, it caters to the populist uh, demands. And uh, my uh, question is, why are we so ideologically weak as a nation? And why are we driven by personalities as a society? Jay Panda is the only solution at the end of the day. A personality who will come from somewhere, you don't know who it is, who's, who will change the system. Is that we are waiting for Lord Ram or Krishna or another avatar? We are not the only country. But this attitude does vary a little bit from country to country. Recall the 2008 election for President Obama. Uh, I think most many people believed he could walk on water at that point. He was a personality cult. Uh, you've seen personality cults in Italy, in Britain. Uh, you, you could possibly argue that there are nuanced differences between Northern Europe and Southern Europe. My point is, uh, let's not wish it away, it's human nature. It's human nature to both have adulation for somebody and perhaps in future also condemn the very same person. My point is, it is normal in a democracy for personality to also play a big role as long as it is not the only aspect. If, if our democracy is only about discussing personalities, we have a problem. But I don't think we are there. I think if you, you, you took some of the names, it was not just personality as he is the messiah who will solve all problems. He is the messiah who is going to solve corruption problem or he is the messiah who is promising to give us governance. So there are issues in the subtext that are also being discussed. I am not so bothered. Uh, I think to wish that personality would not play a role in public engagement in a democracy is unrealistic. And as I said, as long as that is not the only factor, there is nothing wrong with it. It is healthy. I think we like superstars. So, you know. Uh, I, I guess we are coming down to the end of it. At the start of it, when I was sitting here, I was noticing Idli Vada tea coffee and I said, now that's a greater attraction than being here. So I've seen people go out there, come back in. I hope you've digested what these three speakers have tried and shared with you this morning. Uh, and I hope even if it means just 20 extra votes and not 200 tweets, we would, uh, we would probably be walking further towards the vision that they started off with for India. Thanks very much for all those who patiently, diligently endured and sat down here. Thanks very much.